Yes, guys, welcome to a brand new podcast. I'm your host, Conan, and I'm joined here today by my good friends, Christopher Mona Smith, the legend. So, um, a quick story actually before we get into it. My first unofficial podcast episode was actually with you when you interviewed me at the start of this year. Uh-huh. And so, basically, in today's episode, we're going to be reversing roles and I'm going to be asking you all the questions. Let's go. Hell yeah. So, before we do get into it, Christopher, just do like a quick little introduction on yourself. Imagine you didn't know who I am. Just say what you do and who you are. Sure. Um, that's great. So, to give a best illustration of me, I used to be a college athlete in college. Okay. So back in the day, I used to play sports. I was an athlete. If you heard of me, you probably associated me with the baseball player. Okay. And now, since then, I've kind of become a digital nomad. Nomad. I kind of saw the nine to five as modern day slavery. I saw my dad working at nothing wrong against it, but I knew it wasn't for me. So if I wasn't going to be a millionaire playing baseball, I was going to be a millionaire chasing online businesses. So in summary. That's a little bit of myself. Okay, so let's just start from the beginning. So obviously, I'm assuming you went through the usual education system, high school, university, you said you were a baseball yeah. player. So kind of talk to me about how you um, just kind of went through school in terms of like high school and then university and then when did you almost like realize that this whole, like you wanted to be a millionaire and wanted to do your like your own thing and create your own path in life? That's a great question. You know, I think Growing up, it was, you know, baseball. Yeah. Baseball was like, you know, I, I always wanted to make an impact. I always wanted to inspire. And the people that inspired me were like high-level baseball players because I wanted to be like them. Right. right, yeah. And you get that desire as a young man. It's like, I want to inspire. I want to go out and make a difference. I want to make people better, right? Mm-hmm. And when I no longer had baseball, it was like, okay, I needed another I needed another avenue. I needed something else to kind of put in front of myself to inspire. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I got into social media, posting online, kind of sharing my message. It's like hey, maybe I can build up an audience and I can make that same impact as more of like an influencer. It really matured over time into what it is today. But at the very beginning, it was just like, hey, I want to inspire people to be better. And so was this during college or when was this? So this started in college. So it was my four years in university. So fun fact, I was actually homeschooled. And so I never did go to an actual high school. Oh, really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, I was high school. I was homeschooled all K through 12. Okay. And then I went to junior college for two years after that, and then I transferred to a mid-major D1 for two years. Then I played a little bit in the prospect league, and then got into entrepreneurship. So it was right about after my, I would say my second year of junior college, I was posting more on social media, trying to experiment with vlogs, trying to get on YouTube, because I was inspired by Christian Guzman. Okay, yeah. Right, as, as some of you guys may know. And so then I was like, okay, I want to like, emulate something like that so then i started the process of posting on social media trying to get myself out there okay and then so what was like your ultimate purpose with that because obviously you were doing baseball sure. you were st- what were you studying by the way i was studying business and marketing okay okay yeah. and so when you were in university did you have like a goal of like okay once i get this degree i'm gonna get this certain job and then work a nine to five or when did you start to like realize that it wasn't really for you i never went to university for anything other than to play baseball Oh, so your main goal was to play baseball? 100%. Oh, okay. Yeah, so like... Similar to me, I played soccer. That's yeah, the main I, reason why I went. <laughs> we did connect on that earlier, yeah, talking yeah. about sports. And like, for me, yeah, 100% it was the same way. Like, you know, I played through high school, wasn't drafted. So it's mm-hmm. like, okay, now next step is college. And so what's the best level of college? Well, it's D1. So what do I need to get to do D1? And that route for me looked like two years of junior college okay. and then transferring to a D1. But what's funny is like... I dropped out of college right before finishing my degree. Oh, so you never even finished. I didn't finish. And that's the thing that I think kind of surprises people to go across your question is that the moment that I knew I wasn't going to use college anymore for advancing my baseball career, Mm -hmm. I was done with it. Wow. And so I walked out. I think I have one semester remaining to graduate. And that's when I walked away to go full time on social media. So what did your parents think of that? Like one semester left, weren't they like, Christopher, just like finish up, you have one semester left, just finish it up. Was that, what was kind of, what was that like? Yeah, what a good question. So my parents have always been super supportive of my baseball Mm -hmm. career. And I, I kind of made it clear to them that I didn't really have a desire for college outside of baseball. And so when I told them that I was no longer going to be pursuing my career or my college degree and, and going into entrepreneurship, I think they understood that and they've always supported my dreams. Wow. Like they knew I had, they weren't going to give me any money or give yeah. me a handout by any means. Like they were like, okay, if you believe you can do it, go. And you know, I kind of built a reputation with myself. It's like anything I put my mind to, okay. I'm going to accomplish it. And so I had that reputation with my parents, I think as well. So when I told them, Hey, I think I've got an opportunity to take this. They're like, go for it. So I'm very blessed in that aspect. Cause I know 
there's a lot of people that have a lot of pressure from their parents to go to college, go to university, get a degree, get a nine to five. But, you know, I'm thankful my parents supported that. I see it completely different. Yeah, that's freaking awesome. Because on my last podcast, obviously Carson and I, we spoke about this pretty similar topic and we just kind of talked about how your parents just like want the best for you, right? Because obviously getting a degree and working like a secure job, like a secure, right? It's yeah. like, you're not gonna be like, obviously like homeless on the streets. You have a nice secure income. You're gonna be reliable on that, right? And so what was kind of like your thing? Like, okay, so you stopped going to university. What was your immediate thing to like earn money, right? Because you can't survive without earning money. So how did yeah. you like start making money after university with no degree and no real experience in like the outside world? Yeah, good question. So look, going into the making money process was the yeah, challenge. Yeah, yeah. That, that was the challenge. So I, I experimented with a clothing brand when I was in college. I worked like, my schedule in college was crazy to fit in work. I would get up yeah. at 4 a.m., work at a gas station from 4.30 to 8 a.m., come home, had class at 8.30, right? And then from class, we'd have baseball practice at mm. two. Then after baseball practice, it was like I had a couple hours of work on my business, a couple hours to do homework, go to bed, do it all over again. That was my schedule. And so I was able to save up enough money to buy a couple clothing launches. And this okay. was like men's t-shirts, made a couple launches. It took me a while before I turned a profit on those orders just because you know the cost of the order in bulk and everything like that. Yeah. But my first initial income from social media was actually coming from clothing. It just started to become a lot of work for very little profit. Yeah. And so how I was able to kind of make it work was I lived way below my means. Like yeah. I lived with three other roommates in Section 8 housing in Springfield, Missouri, paying like 350 to 400 bucks a month each. Yeah. And like, then I could live off a thousand bucks a month. Right. Because I paid for my car in cash, I was only paying like 350 bucks a month in rent, and I could live off 650 bucks a month in food and gas and activities. It's like, mm -hmm. I could afford to stay in the game and continue to develop those skills. Right, so, yeah, I feel like a lot of young people in general aren't willing to like take that ego hit in terms of like, living with a bunch of different people, like limiting their expenses, not buying flashy things to yeah. show off to people who ultimately don't really care who you are and what you do, right? So it's it seems like from since like day one, you didn't really care about what other people thought of you. And going back to like who inspired you to like start all of it, obviously Christian Guzman, who has his own clothing company. Yeah. Did that kind of like inspire you to start your own clothing company? Or were you always kind of passionate about your own clothes, like how, what was kind of like your mindset behind that? that? That's a really good question. I don't think as much my goal was to build a clothing brand, as much mm -hmm. of it was like, okay, who is making money doing what I love for full time? And the person I had in mind was Christian Guzman yeah. and Max Tuning. Yeah. And that's who we would watch. And it was like, okay, well, how are they making money? Well, it looks like they're making money on YouTube and clothing. So it was like my logical explanation was, okay, I need to do YouTube and clothing. So that's kind of how I got started. That was my inspiration. And I think over time it kind of molded into, my deepest desire was to inspire people okay. and make money through fitness. Okay. And I think at the beginning, I just thought clothing and YouTube was the route, but it wasn't until later on that I found out coaching and mentorship and stuff like that. Okay, interesting. And I, I don't wanna like go back and forth, but quickly going back to what are you like? What got you into fitness? Because obviously, I know you said you were a big baseball guy. Yeah. But what got you into fitness? Because just from my personal experience, it seems like a lot of like ex athletes or former athletes almost like stopped playing their sports and tradition more into like bodybuilding or just like fitness in general. So obviously, you coming back from like an athletic background. Yeah. It seems like you've always been athletic. Mm -hmm. But when did you like fully like just like submerge yourself into like having a passion for fitness and like wanting to inspire other people in fitness? Well, I never really enjoyed fitness at the beginning. Really? So I tried it at 13. My mom had me do it to like build some muscle and I yeah. hated it. I hated it. I did P90X. I didn't enjoy it. It was just uncomfortable. It was yeah. uncomfortable and I didn't really see the need. I was already the best player in the baseball team. I was already like, I, there was a level really of comfort with that. Yeah. I was gifted. I had talent and there was a level of comfort with that that I didn't understand until I got older. Yeah. You, got, you got to train for life because somebody else out there is working and you're not. And oh, you me that guy will win, right? Yeah. So at that time, I didn't really understand it. And so I, when I went unrecruited out of high school, this was a shock to me. Like I truly believed I was one of the best overlooked chip on my shoulder. Like I cannot believe I was overlooked and I had no college scholarships out of high school. I was homeschooled. I played for a homeschool baseball team, but we played high schools and we would just thump them. And yeah, I, yeah. I would have great years and I would, we would just thump them, but nobody ever 
gave me an opportunity. And so for that was like a chip on my shoulder. Yeah. And so when I wanted to get onto a junior college, I had like three months before the baseball season started to find a team. And that's like really late. So I put together a highlight reel video. I sent it to every junior college in Missouri and Illinois just to see if somebody would be willing to give me a chance based off my highlights. And these two schools got back to me and like one was the best school of the conference and one was the worst. And the worst was like, hey, we're going to pay for everything. Come in, play for us. You're going to be our starting catcher. We'll give you money nice. to live off. And I was like, okay, I got an offer. Okay. But it was the worst team in the Division One Junior College bracket. And they had never sent a single player to D1. Mm. And your goal was to go pro, right? Like my, my goal was yeah. to go D1, right? And so the other college, the other college was, hey, we just had a guy go in the draft. We need a bullpen catcher, but we kind of already got our starters. Mm. But this school had over 70% of their players signed D1. They had draft picks there. They had high level prospects that weren't making the grades. Like this was a top 10 team in the country year after year after year after year in junior college. Wow. And they were like, yeah, but you're gonna have to pay for everything out of pocket. And so at that time I had $10,000 saved up. I went to that school, I invested everything, planned all my money out, bought my car. This was like all in for me. Like wow. when I talk about getting uncomfortable, yeah. this is like, that moment of discomfort for me because I knew I needed to be in an environment of people that were better than me yeah. in order to find out if I was at that level or to prove to myself that I could compete with that level of guys. Mm. Okay. And yeah. so I took that leap of faith. I didn't go the easy route. I could have been the starter, could have yeah. been the star guy, but I would have never known what I could have been capable of. And so when I went to this route, it was an all out gamble. And bro, when I tell you, <laughs> I got to these school. These guys were just like freaking show. Was it like intimidating? Oh, like, monsters, bro. Yeah. I'm talking like built like brick shit houses. Like, wow. No lie. Fast. Top draft picks. Top D1 athletes. Like these guys were year five tool players. Damn. And I got there and I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I'm even going to see the field, yeah. I better get into the gym. And right. Like, every day, 5 a.m., I made a promise to myself. It's like, if I am going to play. It'll be because I outwork everybody else, not because I'm the most gifted. Yeah. That was the first moment when I realized, okay, I should have been working out when I was 13. Mm -hmm. Like, because these were all the guys that were working out at 13. Yeah. And when I faced them at that junior college, it was like, mm, now I need to, now I see the importance of this. And so dude, I just made a commitment to myself, ate everything, like meals planned, eating calories, macros, lifting twice a day, like work out with the team and then work out by myself in the evening or get up at 5 a.m. work out and then work out, practice with the team like, every single day. And I just fell in love with the process. Yeah. I fell in love with like, dude, I can control this. Yeah. It doesn't matter if my coaches pick me to play or not. I can control getting to the gym. I can control getting uncomfortable. I can control getting better with what I've been given. And that's going to give me the best shot that when my opportunity does come on the field, I'm going to make the most of it. And it just became a lifestyle, bro. Yeah. And I just fell in love with the process. So yeah, long story short, yeah, dude, I kind of went off on awesome. a tangent, yeah. but uh, that is, that's what got me into the gym series. Yeah, no, I can definitely relate to that. Obviously me coming from like a soccer background, I grew up being like one of the best kids in school and my like it's team in general. And then when I got to university and college, I'm like, almost like a reality check, like, oh wow, I'm actually not as good as I thought I was, right? Yeah. And then I started to take the gym a lot more serious, I started to like bulk up, to like get faster, get stronger, get bigger, and just like an overall better athlete. And then I slowly started to transition out of playing soccer and more into like bodybuilding and just like fitness in general, right? Yeah. So I can definitely relate with that story. And so going back to the clothing company, uh, obviously you tried it, but it didn't go according to plan or I guess the margins yeah. weren't there really. Mm -hmm. And so what was like your next move to make money, right? Because this was when you dropped out, you had to figure out a way to pretty much survive and like thrive um, with no college degree, nothing to fall back on, right? Mm -hmm. So what was your next move after failing your clothing? Or I won't say, did you fail? What, what did you say that? Yeah, or? that's a good question. So I made a lot of mistakes. So I think I canceled out the profit that I made at the beginning oh, of okay. the clothing brand. Okay. Um, so I think it may have been like a net even okay. a net negative, but it wasn't necessarily a net profit because I did make some mistakes. Yeah. But I just quickly realized that like the level of success I wanted in my life wasn't going to come from clothing mm -hmm. and I didn't have the money to create velocity to sell in volume. Yeah. And I wasn't necessarily as passionate about clothing as much as I was with inspiring people. Yeah. And so that, that's what eventually prompted the change. And that's when I get into social media marketing. Okay. It's a whole another story. So can you describe that to me? What does that actually like entail? Yeah. So we did social media marketing from a standpoint of we would 
sell clients on the ability to grow their page by a thousand to two thousand followers a month okay. and it would be done through like following engaging liking and what it would do is we have a software where we could put in an account and then the demographic they wanted to grow in, the location, everything, super specific. And the software would follow a certain number of people and maybe follow the, unfollow them five days later if they didn't follow back. Mm. They could engage on a thousand people's posts a day under a certain couple of hashtags or certain people's accounts. And we could do it on these things where we could automate it 24 seven. And then the client would just get these followers month after month and we would charge anywhere from 250 to a thousand bucks a month for the service. Okay. Right. And so, the way it worked was, you know, let's say for instance, we would close them at $250 a month, we'd help them grow 500 to 1,000 followers mm -hmm. in a super targeted niche. Well, that client would get a huge return on those 1,000 followers that they would be like, hey, I wanna ramp up the activity. I would like to get this many followers. Okay, it's gonna be this price for this term of months. And what ended up happening, dude, is it was getting such an incredible result for our clients. And it was such a simple process to fulfill because once it was programmed, it was automated. Right. Yeah. And dude, I'm telling you, bro, it scaled fast. Yeah. And this was my first real taste of like a ideal business model where the fulfillment was super automated yeah. and the lead acquisition was a lot of referrals and word of mouth because the service was so good. Right. And, and it, so, sorry, did you create this or was this under someone else's? So, uh, well, it was, it was more of like a package. So the software existed from another company. Okay. We had network from our fitness influencer events and also with my clothing brand from working with influencers okay. that I could just, I had a connection to sell the service to. And so I was like, okay, let me just use this software, sell a service. And I was started to use it in my clothing brand as yeah. well. And so I was like, okay, well we could use this for other people to grow their businesses. And so that's kind of how things took off. Okay. And so did that, well, you were you successful at that? Yeah, dude, we were really successful. So we would, we, we probably did around half a million dollars in contracted revenue within a six month period. Oh wow. And then we lost the whole business in 48 hours. Okay. So how did you lose that? Because <laughs> I, I've heard stories of a couple like things happening in yeah. that situation. So what specifically happened there? Yeah. It's you want to go into detail with that? Yeah. So my biggest business failure was when I was running my social media marketing business and Facebook bought Instagram. And the moment they bought Instagram, they limited the number of actions you could take on people's accounts. And when they limit the number of actions you can take on people's accounts, it would like put their account on a three day ban. Right. And so we were automating people's Instagram accounts and they knew this. Facebook wants the ad revenue from Instagram. Yeah. They were going to come after businesses like us as soon as they bought them. And so at that moment, all of our clients started to get three day bans. Like imagine if your business goes down for coaching for three days, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm losing revenue. Yeah. So we had to issue refunds on contracts. We had everybody cancel. By the time it was all said and done, we lost 98% of our clients in a matter of 48 hours. Oh, wow. And what year was this in? This was in 2019. I think okay. it was right around 19, 18. Yeah. Okay. And so what did you do after that? What was like your game plan after that? Dude, it was like rock bottom. Yeah. Rock bottom. Um, I got a serving job and started doing vacation sales to make, make ends meet. Mm. And once I started to make ends meet, I was like, okay, I don't, I hate these jobs. Oh my gosh. I worked these jobs for like two months to get back on my feet. Hated it. Didn't like having a boss, had better ideas myself on how we could run the business yeah, better, yeah. but they don't care. And you just are supposed to do what you're told. Do what shut you're up, told. Shut yeah. up and do what you're told and get a paycheck and yeah. be happy. Right. And so right away it solidified. I don't want to do this. And so that's when I began online coaching. A lot of people don't have that mindset. I mean, what you just said, obviously like it makes sense. Like I don't want to listen to anyone else. I want to make my own rules. I want to create something for my own. But I mean, you see 90% of people, they just do what they're told or mm -hmm. not. I mean, not like slaves, but it's like, Hey, do this, do that. Will give you a nice stable income, sold, whatever, right? And a lot of people don't have your center mindset where it's like it's almost like an entrepreneurial kind of mindset, like, no, I wanna do my own thing, I wanna create my own rules. And so obviously you going through kind of like that phase when you were listening to other people, that must have really just like frustrated you and be like, Oh my god, this is not for me, I don't wanna do this, I wanna create my own stuff. Yeah. So you did the serving stuff, you absolutely hated it. And then what did you do after that? Because obviously now you have this super successful, yeah. um, what would you call it, like mentoring program? Or? Sure, sure, yeah. I, I mean, I was, was that like your next thing? After uh, that? So the next thing was online coaching. Online coaching, that's yes. right. Yeah, so, I just want to go step by step by step, just like know, like <laughs> yeah. follow along your entire journey. For sure. So next up was the online coaching. Yes. Okay. Next step was the online coaching. And this was where I started to really get passionate about bodybuilding. I was lifting for performance in baseball. Yeah. 
I started lifting for bodybuilding during my social media marketing days. And I was like, okay, I think I've accumulated enough knowledge. I've been training for like six years at that time. I think I can start bringing on clients. And so I just launched my coaching business, started selling it because I had that network of fitness people yeah. from influencers, from social media marketing. I had an, like a network to sell to. And you've had experience doing it as well. And experience of doing it. So, you know, you're fine tuning your sales skills, yeah. fine tuning your marketing throughout this process. So I was like, all right, I'm going to get coaching. And I wanted my coaching business to look like my social media marketing business from a business model perspective. Yeah. Like I, I knew what I didn't like about the clothing brand and I knew what I did like about the marketing business. And so I was like, okay, I want to emulate as much of the marketing business as possible. And that started my year long journey of just constantly tinkering with my online coaching business, trying to build better systems trying to create more freedom, trying to create a good offer, trying to find and package something that was going to be able to take me on the same journey as my marketing business did mm -hmm. as far as like financially. Yeah. And so, yeah, it took, dude, my first year was brutal. I failed a lot, made a lot of mistakes. I, I didn't have contracts. I didn't charge the right price. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of testimonies. Like I was very well qualified and I could sell, but I was selling a bad opportunity or a bad business model. Right. Like it wasn't a bad offer. It was a bad business model and it didn't have a great offer. And so, yeah, it took me a while before I had my first 10 K month. But mm -hmm. when I had my first 10 K month, that was like, okay. I've reinforced to myself that I'm capable of building a business. Yeah. I've got a pretty darn good fulfillment system. I'm getting consistent leads that are coming in each month. I want to scale. Mm -hmm. And then 60 days later, we had our first 50K month and then kind of the rest is history. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. And so obviously now we're at this point where you're helping other online fitness coaches scale their online coaching business. Yeah. And so when did you feel comfortable helping other people do that? Obviously. You told your story, you've been super successful at it. Yeah. Uh, why don't you feel comfortable helping other people do something similar that you kind of went through? Sure. So, you know, I, I did a little bit of coaching with just like a handful of clients through the social media marketing days. Oh, okay. Through like that. I always had like a handful of friends that I would coach through summer shredding and stuff like that. Oh, cool. And so I, I had a lot of experience with that. And so then once I had built my third business, I had a pretty good understanding of systems. And during this whole process, I was starting the promotions business, which was hosting networking events for influencers. And I was networking with a bunch of influencers mm. and meeting people with big audiences. And I read a really good book that was by MJ DeMarco. He said, wherever there's a million dollars, there's a, wherever there's a million eyeballs or a million dollars, you gotta figure out how to monetize it. Yeah. Right? And so it's like, okay, I just need to figure out how to monetize this 100 million follower network that I have access to through social media yeah. influencers. And so then all everything kind of combined together. Like I felt very confident in my business. We started a bodybuilding team that really started to take off and I started to teach these guys how to post on social media and they were growing their social media pages fast. They were documenting their bodybuilding shows. People were building loyal communities. And it was like, okay, the next step is just, they need to offer coaching. Yeah. Follow on the same path that I did and you'll see similar success. So, you know, one, I had influencers at my influencer retreat asking me how I was running my coaching mm -hmm. business, how I had way less followers but making way more money and they weren't. And then I had guys that I had coached into a bodybuilding show wanting to take social media fully and do a career similar to mine. It was like, it was almost a perfect storm. Yeah. You know, and so I was like, sure, I'm gonna take on a handful of guys. I've helped a few people in the past. Let me, let me, let me do this. So okay. brought on a few guys. Dude, they implemented my systems. They had crazy success and did it click for me. I've always been the impact guy. I've, I've always wanted to inspire. Since day one, you wanted to help other people, I wanted right? to help other people, yeah. dude. I wanted to inspire people. And it's like, when that moment clicked, it's like, okay, I might be changing thousands of lives in my coaching business, but if I can build thousands of leaders, mm -hmm. then I'll go change thousands of lives. Now my impact can be magnified. Yeah. And at that point, I wasn't really worried about money. Like, that part, I've always been frugal ever since I was in Section 8 housing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> living Back out 350 day. bucks a month, right? Or living in college and budgeting out all my money. Like, I knew it was like to live frugal. And so for me, it's never been hard staying frugal while making money. And what that has done is just create a lot of freedom where I don't have to worry about money or lifestyle inflation, they yeah, call it. Yeah, yeah. And I can focus more on my impact. And so, yeah, I was able to drop everything, go all in on this business, and man, Ever since it's been 
life changing. Yeah. So when did you start that? Was that like 2020 ish? Or? So, let's see here. It started when we had our bodybuilding team. So I would say right around 2021, it started to become kind of the main thing. Okay. Awesome. And so obviously you've been super successful at it. Obviously living with you, I can see just the success, success in real life, which is super inspiring to see. And so what's almost like your future plans with this? Where do you see this whole company going in the future um, for the company and also just for you yourself and just everything else that is involved? Um, when it comes to like your personal growth and the business's growth? My biggest priority now is to build strong Christian leaders. Like I truly wholeheartedly believe MBG is meant for a purpose. Like we have the opportunity of mentoring young men, young leaders, young women into using their platforms for good. Like, you know, I read a statistic the other day, I was like 60% of Americans are overweight, yeah. right? And that's leading to a ton of heart disease and diabetes. Like the need to educate American people on how to take back control of their health is a top priority for America. And I just really felt like what I was doing with my social media and what I could teach other young leaders how to use their profiles in a way to reach these people that need help, but be able to build a business solving a huge problem and allow them to inspire people and make that difference and leave a legacy. Like moving forward, my goals are more about impact. Yeah. Like I've accomplished what I wanted to create financial freedom for myself. And now I would say we're on a mission to build leaders and helping these young leaders build legacies that are going to echo for a lifetime. Yeah, I mean, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, because I've heard this thing where I can going back to like being financially just like freedom. Mm -hmm. um, would you agree? Like, I'm not at this point yet, so that's why I want to ask you. Like, do you think there's like almost like law of diminishing returns when it comes to like making X amount of money? Like, anything more than that just causes more and more stress sure. and less and less happiness? Like, do you think there's like a sweet spot for that? 100%. And then once you surpass it, it's like all about, okay, once I've earned X amount, I'm comfortable. Now I really just want to focus on like just impacting other people in like yeah. a positive way. Yeah, 100%. Like, I think at 15K, you can pretty much live the life that you want to live as long as you're not stupid, okay. right? If you want to have the super nice sports car and a house, you're maybe thinking like 20, 25K, yeah. right? But anything after that is just law of diminishing returns yeah. like you're making more money but sacrificing more freedom right yeah. right and so for you out there if you're a single guy or a single woman and you're in your 20s 15k a month you can live the life of your dreams on 15k a month you don't need any more than that you're still stacking cash you're still living anywhere you want you can travel whenever and you can have a good transportation right 25k a month you're stacking so much cash if you're living frugal you're getting ahead so fast you're going to be in the top one percent you stay consistent for 10 years yeah Right. And so just by doing that, that's the sweet spot. Yeah. hundred percent. So for anybody's out there is like, Hey, like, what should I strive for? 15 to 25 K a month is the sweet spot. If you try to go above that, just prepare yourself. You're going to sacrifice freedoms. Mm -hmm. You're going to sacrifice relationships. And if you don't have a strong sense of purpose behind what's pushing you to the next level, like if it's not bringing you fulfillment, if you're not accomplishing God's purpose in your life, then that is going to cause you to burn out. Yeah. And then you may lose it all. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's really important for a lot of young men because obviously you want to keep chasing and chasing and chasing, but ultimately it's like you're just chasing for the sake of chasing it and you're just diminishing or just like, you're just like, like you said, diminishing law of returns, right? Yeah. Okay, so obviously going back to the whole financial thing, you said 15K is like, I, like ideal in terms of like you're yeah. comfortable, you got financial freedom, time freedom, location freedom, right? Sure. And so it's all good and well like saying that, but how do men actually are not men, just like people in general, how do people actually achieve that goal? What do you think are some valuable skills people need in general to um, create that for themselves? 100%. Well, you know, I can speak to people who are on social media and are influencers you need three things. You need to create a service or product with value that solves the problem. Number one, you have to create that. Number two, you have to sell it. Right? You've yeah. got to be able to persuade people. You need to help people see the value of this service. You need to show where this service fills the gap in helping them solve their problems. Like you have to sell. And then the last one is execute. Like, you know, if you're selling a service, you got to execute on that service, build the relationship, solidify that you were the right person to work with. They're going to refer friends or if it's a product, right? Ship it quickly, have your customer service, yeah. be in contact with that customer. So anybody that's wanting to build a goal, you got to, you got to create a service or product. 
and then you have to sell it at volume in order to equal the revenue amount profit wise that you need to be at in order to create that life. So let's say you're running a business and you have 50% margins. Mm. That means you need to sell $30,000 a month in order to profit 15K, yeah. right? And so you need to sell at volume to reach that revenue goal and then you just need to execute on the fulfillment. Like customers are gonna keep coming back and you're gonna get referrals if you're executing on the fulfillment of that service or product. Right, okay, and so where do you recommend people to like find a product or service? Do you think people should go towards something they're super passionate about or something where they can see more money? And obviously you started your own clothing company, which I'm assuming, were you like, again, were you passionate about that or was it just simply, I wanna make more money? Was that like your main goal? I was passionate about making money in the fitness industry. Just fitness in general. And creating a culture and inspiring people, absolutely. I think fitness, the clothing brand accomplished that by building community, having influencers, and building a mission behind the brand. Yeah. But it just, like, you gotta make money. You gotta make money, you gotta spend money and make money, and I didn't have any money to spend to speed up the velocity. Yeah, yeah. Right, and so I had to look for a better opportunity vehicle. Okay, and then my second question, and this is a personal question I have for you, is that, I've noticed you're such a good salesperson, like just your conviction when you talk on the phone, speaking to other people, just your social skills in general, you know how to spark a conversation, which is arguably one of the best skills to have nowadays because obviously we see people like, especially younger kids, this younger generation just like glued on their phone the entire time, yeah. not looking, not, not making eye contact, yeah. not talking with a lot of conviction and just like being really insecure about themselves. And so were you always just a good person at just talking in general and like, good at sales or is that like a skill you had to develop i think a little bit of both like i've always been fascinated with people okay i like talking to people because i feel like i there's something to learn from every single person you talk to like you know you're the sum of your five closest friends you know i, I yeah. hope you agree with that Absolutely. and so like not all your five great closest friends have to be great at making money Sometimes one is great at making money and one's really good at being a father mm -hmm. and one's really good at being a leader and one's really good at serving the community. It's like, you know, all of those things kind of come together, right? And so um, to kind of go along with what you were saying, I think it's extremely important in this period of time when like things are a little bit hard and the pressure is stacking, Yeah. right? It's so important to have people in your community like that. And so how did you develop this sell or the skill of like selling and your conviction? Getting the reps in. Yeah. Get in the reps. Like conviction, make yourself a better person, be fascinated with people, let people talk, mm -hmm. ask questions, be genuinely interested. To go on sales, and I think it went off on a little tangent there, but it, my skill of sales came from being fascinated with people and then just talking to a lot of people. Right. Like volume. Just reps. In the reps. Yeah. yeah. And it's like starting conversations is uncomfortable sometimes for people. Yeah. And so to just put yourself in a situation to be uncomfortable, you have to be you have to build that reputation with yourself that you're okay with that. Like getting up early, having a routine, being in the gym, eating the foods that you should, not what you want. Yeah. Right? So you build that up so you're more comfortable being in uncomfortable positions. You'll go start conversations with people in the gym. Right. Right? Does that make it, sense? It does totally. And so if you know something is going to make you better as a person, so if you want to be better at sales, right, you need to have conviction about what you're selling. Okay? If what you're selling, you yeah. truly wholeheartedly believe it's Believe, going, yeah. Yeah. If you truly wholeheartedly believe that this is going to make a difference, yeah in this person's life, the way you communicate to people is gonna convey that and that will sell. And then the second thing is just, just care about people. Like relationships, like when I hop on the phone, I don't know if I'm gonna close that person or not, but at the end of that phone call, I always want them to remember that I was a great person. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna ask great questions. I'm gonna be present in the conversation. I'm going to let them speak. I'm going to talk about things that they wanna talk about. I want to build rapport. I wanna earn that person's trust. I wanna build that relationship. And then your conviction can sell from there. That's so powerful. Cause I think this whole like sales term, like it sounds like obviously so salesy, but what you just said, it's like actually like building a relationship with them, actually caring about what they have to tell you. And like, just like building like an actual good, just like, like, what's the word not community but just like relationship with them i think is so important because people aren't going to buy anything from you if they don't like no one trusts you right yeah and so if you come off super salesy or just like push your products down their throat it's like people are most likely not going to buy would you agree with that 100 yeah. percent. if you don't have that person's best interest you're not going to sell yeah and if you do sell you're probably not going to keep that customer yeah they're going to look for the first opportunity to get out like and i think you know you hit the nail right on the head like if you just want what's best for that person if you have conviction, then you're gonna believe that the product you're selling is going to help that person, right? Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? 100%. Right, and so just by understanding somebody, their goals and weaknesses, 
in helping them solve their problems is if that service or product that you're selling solves that problem, then the conviction is going to overtake the conversation you're going to be able to sell. Yeah, 100%. Now, I want to segue a bit more. Obviously, we talked a lot about business, money, this and that, right? But let's just shift it a bit more towards right. relationships. Oh, we'll take so, a little trip. Yeah, all right. so all throughout this journey, like, obviously, it sounds like you've been super committed and super driven to just following your passion and just, like, following your purpose, right? But was there a time when you folks a bit more or maybe you stumbled across like a couple of relationships when it comes to like girlfriends, dating, this and that, was that ever a distraction for you or were you always just like focus on your main purpose in life? That's a, that's a, that's a really, cause I think there's a lot of things yeah. people have to say to that because obviously people say, Oh no, it's a distraction. You should go monk mode all the time. This and that, whereas other people are saying like, Oh no, it's healthy to have a relationship. This and that, right? So there's a lot of like conflicting like opinions on this. So what, yeah. what was kind of just like your personal journey, and then also just like advice for people who are going on a similar journey that you have been on. Yeah. Um, just in general, just like advice when it comes to that. <sighs> kind of like asking yeah. this like personally for myself. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's such a good question, and I think a lot of people are asking this question, and it's a question that I've asked myself many times. Right. And I wholeheartedly believe that you know I'm going to speak to you as a young man, and so this is more so towards a man. Is yeah. that like? Your job is to find your purpose in life and pursue it with the best of the gifts that God has given you, mm -hmm. right? That's your purpose. And if you find the right woman, she is going to magnify that purpose mm -hmm. and support you and encourage you and uplift you and give you a family along the way. And you're going to need to provide for that family and you're going to have children. That's going to require time. It's going to require commitment, but it's going to solidify your conviction for your purpose, mm -hmm. which is the way God designed it. Right. And so that is such a powerful gift. And if you find somebody like that, by God, don't let them pass up. Right. But let's talk about the opposite of that, because I'm very fortunate to be near that point in my life. And, and I'm seeing how amazing that can be. But I also know what the opposite side feels like. And women, women want your attention. Okay. They want to find a man that has a strong sense of purpose, that is driven, has a goal, has a purpose. And they want to be the one that can take your attention away from that. Right. And for men, a lot of them, I feel like get caught up in this. They have insecurities in their own life that is marked by their not ability to provide for themselves. They don't have confidence in their own ability because they don't have any discipline. They've never made anything out of their lives. They're uncomfortable. They've been fed dopamine, so they don't work hard for anything. It's like when they feel like their life is out of whack and they're depressed, they think that a relationship is going to solve that problem. And it's just another form of comfort yeah. to prolong the inevitable fact they need to change. And then guys will spend hours trying to learn how to talk to girls or how to get a girl in bed or how to seduce a girl. It's like you're wasting all of your time mm. because as a man, women will be attracted to you and your purpose. So focus on your purpose and magnifying the gifts that God has given you. And the right woman will come into your frame naturally because you're something of value. Yeah, that's right? super powerful because I think a lot of people like just guys in specific, like they want to just like chase after girls. But in reality, it's like you have to focus on yourself, focus on your own purpose. And then, and now it sounds cliche and super cheesy, but it's like then girls will start chasing after you, right? Would so you kind of agree with that? It's cliche, but it's the truth. Yeah. It, it's 100% the truth. Like if you see a man of high value as another man who is trying to become high value or in the process of it, I want to network with that person because they're doing something right. Yeah. They're on purpose. Their time is valuable. They're making an impact. They're a good leader. And girls are attracted to that, right? Just as another man wants to network yeah. with that person in their community, a woman's going to want to be that person's man. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so absolutely. Absolutely. It's cliche, but it's the truth. Yeah. And so when did you uh, meet your, uh, your girlfriend? Yeah. hundred percent. So we met actually, it's funny on a dating app, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> which is the new era, which is great. It's so yeah. fun to talk about, but, uh, that's a story we can get into details about that. <laughs> but, um, ah, we met that way. We had a first date, we had a little wine bar, got to know her. And you know, what's funny is like our first date, we talked about all the most important things first. Like we covered all the base. Neither one of us wanted to waste time. And that was okay. apparent in the conversation. So what did we do? I didn't have time to waste. I'm on my mission. I'm on my purpose. Yeah. She knows what she's looking for. She's know what she needs in her life to lead her properly. And so our first date consisted of what's your sexual expectations? What were your past relationships like? What kind of future do you want to have? How many kids do you want? What do you want your life to look like? We talked about what most people should talk about when they're getting close to marriage on our first date. Wow. And so that way we knew if we were compatible or not because neither one of us wanted to waste time. Yeah. And I think if you're somebody of high value, that's an indicator that 
you're getting close to that point because you know what you deserve, you know what you need, and you're not willing to waste time on the pleasure of a relationship or pursuing a relationship if you know it's going to be a dead end. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like sometimes as I got older, you know, I would go on dates with girls, I would get opportunities to meet women, but I could tell from the first day if it was somebody where that relationship was going to end if I pursued it. Right. And you can just gather character from reps. Mm. Talking to people, building relationships, just talking to girls in sales and in a business environment, I can pick up on little cues about their personality. Like maybe they might be needy or maybe they might be a little bit, you know, insecure. It's like you can start to pick up those things just from your repetitions of conversation. Right. Going back to the whole, to the whole reps thing, I think that's so awesome because I myself made a mistake in the past before where um, like I, I used to read books about like sales. I like watched endless amount of YouTube videos on like like how to talk to girls, how to do this, how to do that. And it's like, ultimately, I did not learn a single thing until I actually like took, put it into practice and actually put the reps in, right? Yeah. Just when it comes to like talking to other people, talking to girls, calling people, doing sales, just anything in life, right? I mean, I think a lot of people just like get almost like brainwashed into like this whole self-help porn. Mm -hmm. They just like read endless books, they read or they watch endless YouTube videos on like how to talk to a girl, how to do this, how to do that. But ultimately like you won't really, like that won't do anything really, yeah. right? It's like, unless you actually are willing to like put yourself out there, get uncomfortable, mm -hmm. put in their reps, that's how you ultimately um, to like get better and learn more about yourself as well, right? Sure. And so what would you, um, going back to the whole relationship thing, where do you think is like a good place to like, find good girls because obviously I guess you were really lucky finding your woman on the dating app because sure. I've heard a bunch of like bad things about sure. dating apps, right? Sure. Tinder, Bumble, you name it, right? Yeah. There's all just like, there's like people that are just looking for like short term kind of things, sure. nothing really long term. And so okay. how did you kind of like filter that out? Would you recommend dating apps or would you recommend some more like in-person approaches? How would you go about sure. that? Well, Tinder is a wasteland. Yeah. And Bumble makes the girls make the first move. And I think yeah. men should initiate the first move. Okay. And so Hinge just kind of became the only one out there that I had heard some good things about. Right. right? Okay. You know? So that's kind of how I ended up on Hinge. Okay. Funny story there. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. And so, so obviously it worked for you tremendously, but do you recommend people to like cold approach as well? Like yeah. in person? Because Sorry. Quick story. Yeah. I just really want to get this off my chest. Yeah. Obviously, Chris, you noticed know last weekend I went out for like my first ever time, I got extremely drunk. And when I went to all these different bars, I talked to a lot of people. I, yeah. I talked to probably like 20 different girls. And something I noticed is that I wasn't obviously like, like I was drunk, right? And I wasn't looking for anything long-term, but something that I noticed is that all these females that I talked to, they were all taken by their boyfriend, obviously who was there as well. But I'm just wondering like, even if I were to try or try to look for like a, like a long-term, like good girl, or good girl to be with, I probably would not be going to a bar because that automatically just kind of shows me their values and what they mm -hmm. like do sure. in terms of like like going out, um, short term relationships, this and that. Yeah. So that's just something that I just like thought of right away. It's like if I'm looking for a girl, I would not want to go to a bar sure. because I know that probably just like their their perspective on different things, or at least the life they're in right now, would not fit into mine. Yeah. And so what would you kind of say would be a good place to find like a good girl? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's so good that you're comprehending this already, you're interpreting it for yourself. And, yeah. You know, good for you. I realized this when I was drunk as well. Yeah. Like, I was like, wait, why are you all here when you're with your boyfriend? Yeah. And it's like, I, I don't, maybe it's, maybe it's just my perspective, but if I had a girlfriend, like, I would not have a good time like going out to parties and like going out to clubs and bars like every weekend. Yeah. Like yeah, well, personally for me, like sure. I would not really enjoy that as much, right? Sure. Well, you know, I think that and that's just personal preference. Sure. Like, well, I, you know, and I think most people that are in that environment are unsatisfied with their life because that's their escape. That's their escape. Right. And I think you just recognize that. And these girls are escaping the reality of their life, and you're just going to be the next release or escape yeah right and so if if their life is dependent on you giving them attention what happens when you need to focus on your purpose then there creates resentment and then you can't focus on your pur purpose or lose the relationship and this is what a lot of guys put themselves into so if you're looking for a girl of quality well you need to think about what values are important to you in a spouse and then you need to find out where those type of values are developed and what that environment would look like, right? So probably not a bar, right? <laughs> right, <No>. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right, and so you know, I'm thinking serving their communities. A girl that is serving their communities and giving back and being selfless with their time is probably going to emulate that personality with you as a husband. 
yeah. right? Or if she is going to church and submitting to a yeah. higher power and knowing that there's a higher, higher authority on her life, when you're in charge of providing for her and making her a home and giving her a family and providing and protecting that family, you want her to be able to submit to your purpose and allowing you to be able to do that for mm -hmm. her. So a church is a great way to go. You know, so I would think about the characteristics of what you're looking for in a spouse and where those characteristics are developed and where they might be at use. Yeah, that right? totally makes sense. And would you, just for myself personally, like going back to like you following your purpose, being on your grind, focusing on your long term goals, right? I think it's really important for a young men, like I'm just talking to like myself and people my age as well, is to like really like focus on and just like make sure that like, you have a stable income, like you're actually focusing on uh, creating like a better impact to your community, you're actually like focusing on your own stuff because you won't be able to provide for her or like a family in that matter, right? If you are not yourself, just like established as a person and have like your financial situation like settled down and just like you've just like created like a good base to work off. Yeah. Um, so that's just for myself personally, so just to like quickly like say this, like I'm not looking for anything right now because I know I probably will not be able to provide um, for both of us sure. right now. And yeah. that was, that's just what I think right it's now. Wisdom. It's wisdom. Yeah, and so I really think that's for myself and other people listening, we're probably my age as well, still trying to like figure stuff out. So really let's just like focus on yourself, focus on your own stuff first. And then once you are more established, once you're more like just like comfortable when it comes to like finances, this and that. Sure. Um, and you can kind of like, just have to like look around for other people. Sure. Yeah. I think about to die. I think we're about to die on the camera. Oh, uh, this conversation's been so good, dude. Shit, okay. It, it's been amazing. Well, we are running low on battery. Oh, no. Do you have more batteries? Oh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I just, I just want to have the one... I got a fire away. Let's see if we can sneak it in. Okay, yeah. So going back to the whole social media thing, there's a lot of people. Obviously, we live around Elfland, where there's a bunch of fitness influencers. People trying to make it. I see people all over coming into town, trying to like make it, whatever that means, right? And something that I've noticed talking to a lot of these influencers is that they have a lot of sponsorships that they like rely on, like Alfleets, um, mm. whatever. Um, Gorilla, like, I don't want to name companies, but like supplement companies, clothing companies, and that's like that's like their main kind of like source of income. And so, like, were you ever sponsored by a supplement company? Because I've noticed that you're currently not sponsored, sure. and you probably know that it doesn't pay as much, right? Yeah. But it does come with a lot of clouds and sure. a lot of just like, oh my god, you're the Alfley guy, or whatever, right? So, were you ever sponsored by? Sure. Yeah. So I had a couple sponsorships. I was with TLF for a little while. Okay. Uh, I had a couple supplement sponsors for a little bit and what I learned is that like it's great to get free product and it's great to like build connections with people in those communities but once you've kind of exhausted that community you're ah oh, got it shit well, we're getting close now so once you exhaust that community <laughs> keep going we keep going we keep going for the audio you wanna you wanna like come a bit closer? Yeah, dude, we'll get in here. We'll, we'll go close. All right, guys, to wrap up this episode, we're gonna come a bit closer because the other camera died. So Chris <laughs> is just gonna wrap up his answer and then yeah. we'll wrap things up. Yeah, hundred percent. So we were just talking about social media and people signing with sponsorships. You know, I think it's important to build those connections, build those relationships with people on social media. And then once you've kind of progressed past that, like those companies know how to monetize off of your audience. Yeah. And if you're trying to build a business for yourself, that traffic is going to be better used, funneled into your business than it is for the sponsorship. You're selling someone else's product instead of your own services, right? Sure. In a way. Exactly. So right. would you recommend people to kind of do that? Because obviously I know you're sure. right now not mm -hmm. sponsored by any supplement companies, yeah. but you see a lot of these young people just like, they chase after like this young LA sponsorship, but it's like, like why? Like it's mm. for what reason, right? Yeah. Like obviously you get comes with a bunch of clouds, cool clothes, this and that, and it's super hype and trendy right now. Yeah. But would you agree that it wouldn't really take you anywhere when it comes to that? Yeah, I mean financially it's not going to provide a career for you unless you have hundreds of thousands of followers. Yeah, and right? it's like how stable is that, right? Because they can drop you in immediately for the next handsome dudes in the next couple like exactly. weeks and months, right? Yeah. You're expendable. They're expendable. Yeah. The, the, the moment that you no longer provide value to that company, they're gonna drop you. And if you build a lifestyle on that, yeah. be careful because you're putting yourself at risk. Yeah, in a big hole, right? Yeah. And it's definitely not sustainable, like we said, because they can drop you immediately. You're working for someone else's dream and not your own. Yeah. So you would say focus on your own kind of like business um, before you start to think about, oh, let me get this, let me 
showcase this other product and mm -hmm. um, let me try to get the sponsorship. Yeah. Because I mean, it looks cool. Like you see all these people like Sush, James English, sure. all these other athletes. And it's like, oh my God, I want to live like them, right? Sure. But I know a lot of people like personally as well who are really like struggling financially. They have all yeah. these sponsorships. They look amazing online. Their physiques look great. Mm -hmm. They got all these sponsorships. But it's like when yeah. you know them in person, it's like, they're really struggling when it sure. comes to like finances. Sure. And so that's just for people watching right now. Yeah. It's like, that's probably not a good sustainable way to um, like earn an income, yeah. at least in the long term, right? Sure, hundred percent. Like, like you're, you're, you're gonna have a really hard time making a full-time living off sponsorships, yeah. right? And if you wanna actually create freedom from your social media, you need to know how to monetize that attention on a high margin service or product, not something that is giving you 10% on whatever you refer, yeah. right? So here's my thought with, with sponsorships work with companies that you believe in you have conviction that they work and if you get an exchange for free product for it that's awesome mm -hmm. but don't sell your soul for a supplement company for 100 bucks a month and don't sell your soul i think that's a really important thing so one last question chris before we kind of wrap things off we talked about a lot of things business money relationships my final question for you is what are you scared of the most i know we talked about like the time we're in right now when it comes to like men are getting weaker and weaker society the matrix is making men more feminine making them obey more turning them into slaves what do you kind of like see the future being and what do you like fear the most when it comes to just society in general um with these tough times coming i would say the only thing i'm afraid of is regret like at the end of the day you can only control what you can't control and that is your daily habits that is the way mm -hmm. you live your life the character that you possess and the decisions you make in your life right and the people you keep in your corner and I can control those things. And so my biggest fear is not stewarding the gifts that God has given me for the maximum amount of good in the world. Mm. That's my fear. It's like, I don't want to go down on my deathbed, look back at my life and be like, man, I should have done more. For me, that is my biggest fear. I'm not really scared about what's going on in the world. I know that the Lord is going to provide for me. I don't have anything to fear of this world or man. You know, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Yeah. God's in control. We already know who's winning this battle. Yeah. And my job is to just go through the life that he has given me and maximize the gifts that I've been given for the greatest amount of his glory. Yeah, that's freaking awesome, man. Yeah. So before we wrap things up, Chris, where can people find you when it comes to social media yeah. and connect with you? Yeah, so you can find me on social media at Christopher Monosmith and on my Instagram. You can see links to all my other businesses feel free to check out my youtube video there's a link in my bio if you want to get more access to me feel free to reach out but dude, yeah this yeah. was so much fun man. yeah dude it was great picking your brain man like some of these questions were just for myself as well yeah. just to like kind of get to know you a bit more yeah. so i'll be sure to link all your socials in the description down below if you guys enjoyed this podcast please be sure to go give this video a thumbs up be sure to subscribe as well and we'll see you guys in the next one yes. Peace out. we love this guy subscribe hell yeah get you some knowledge oh, Woo! Yeah. get big bro let's go <laughs> Oh, oh, we can do we can do it up again, right? Oh, oh, that's the one, that's the one. We got on camera too. <laughs> oh, that's awesome.